Yes. Okay, so we're live now. Uh, good morning to everybody who is watching us on LinkedIn, um, YouTube, or on Twitter. Good morning to everybody who joined us on uh, Clubhouse at the moment. Thank you so much for this. It's Wednesday morning here. This is Japan Expert Insights. And today we have a very special guest. Uh, this is Ben from Retire Japan. So Ben Sheeran, he has been uh, in Japan for quite a while and he has also uh, been doing research and uh, working um, in, let's say, as a thought leader here um, about uh, uh, savings and investment as a foreigner, a foreign resident in, in Japan. So today we have uh, Ben who is going to um, tell us uh, a little bit about himself and how he came up with the idea uh, of uh, saving and also investing here in Japan. Also, uh, some of the basics uh, for foreigners who live here and are willing to uh, begin investing um, in, well, dif in different ways. Of course, again, as you can see on the live stream, we have Tim with us. So Tim is going Morning. to... Morning, yes. And uh, so we're going to have a lot of questions. I believe that Yuka will join us uh, later on Clubhouse. So uh, without any further ado, Ben, the mic is yours and uh, let's do it. <laughs> right. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for having me on today. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, that was a very, very, very kind introduction, Maya. Thank you. I don't think anyone's ever called me a thought leader before. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I, I don't want to talk too much because uh, the most interesting thing for me always about any kind of presentation or, or public speaking like this is the questions because that's where we can really explore uh, people's issues. So um, I'm going to talk briefly about myself, how I came to Japan and, and where Retired Japan came from. Uh, and then what Retired Japan is and, and what we do. Uh, and then finally, just do a quick kind of overview of personal finance in Japan. Um, I'm sure we have lots of qualified people on the call, so <laughs> I don't want to uh, put on too many airs. But um, I should probably start with the fact that I'm not a financial advisor. So I'm not qualified to give advice. What I do is run a website and uh, do coaching for people which explores their options. So we can talk about what you can do here in Japan and so on. But uh, before that, I should probably introduce myself. So my name is Ben Sheeran, uh, sometimes Ben Tanaka. So I've taken uh, my wife's family name for certain aspects of my life in Japan, uh, originally because I have stepkids. So it just made things much easier at school if I had the same surname as them. Uh, and now I've kind of taken it on. And fortunately in Japanese, Ben, has a kanji so you can use the kanji for study to represent ben uh, and that's also a common japanese name which is normally uh, read as tsutomu but also some people read it as ben as well so i've met two japanese people that use the study kanji uh, and their name is actually ben in japanese so incredibly lucky because most people don't have that kind of perfect homophone there for, for their names. Um, so I came to Japan in 2000, July of 2000 on the JET program. Uh, we arrived into Tokyo and had three days orientation in the unbearable heat, what it felt like at the time. And then we came up to Sendai and that was my placement. Uh, I'd never heard of Sendai before, of course. Uh, and it wasn't quite the internet that we have now. So I had to look it up in an atlas and see where Sendai was. And I actually asked for Sapporo and Kyoto because they're the only places I'd really heard of in Japan and they put me bang in the middle. So it worked out fairly well. Sendai is actually one of my favorite places in Japan. I think it's one of the best places to live. Um, fight me later if you want to disagree. Um, Sendai and Fukuoka for me are the real gems, but Fukuoka is a bit hot. Right. Um, so I came on the JET program. I did about four years as an ALT working in public schools. Uh, and then I was able to apply for and get a job that I wasn't at all qualified for, which was to be the kind of English teacher's consultant in the Kencho, in the prefectural education office. So I'd be doing training for teachers and lesson observations and workshops and things like that for both the ALTs and the Japanese teachers. Uh, and I did that for four years uh, until suddenly I lost my job at quite short notice. Uh, and the reason for that is because the prefecture outsourced the ALTs. So they went from the JET program, which is a public program, 
to dispatch companies. And of course, once you do that, you don't really need an ALT advisor kind of consultant anymore. So I lost my job there. And that was incredibly traumatic because at that point, uh, we weren't. We didn't have a good savings habit. We didn't have investments. We didn't really have any savings. So I had to call my wife up in November and say, "Ah, yeah. So I'm not going to have a job from April. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to pay the be able to pay the rent." Uh, and that was incredibly traumatic for both of us. And that's where I started thinking about money um, because my my main takeaway from that situation was that uh, it was my fault, basically. The fact that, you know, losing my job put us in this incredibly difficult situation was was basically my lack of planning and my lack of uh, preparation. So I decided to fix that and make sure that it never happened again. Uh, and it hasn't. So <laughs> this <Great>. year. <clears throat> What's up? Great. That's good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this year in March, I kind of lost my job again. My unit, I was working at a university. And uh, they decided not to renew the contracts of uh, all the teachers who were finishing up contracts. Uh, and this time it was fine because we, we do have investments, we do have savings, uh, and it really wasn't a problem at all. And Retired Japan came out of that experience. So I started doing kind of personal finance and reading about personal finance and thinking about personal finance in 2008. And around 2013, I was talking to a friend of mine. So at this point, you know, I'd started, I'd read lots of books. I had a fairly good idea of how things worked. I was talking to a friend of mine in, who lived in Tokyo, uh, and he was telling me about his kind of retirement plans. So he'd been investing with a, uh, a, a kind of advisory firm, more like a sales kind of firm in Tokyo that basically contacts foreign residents and sells them offshore pension plans uh, and he was telling me about his plans and I got so angry <laughs> about this that uh, I went straight home and registered the Retire Japan site and write, wrote the first blog post uh, and that's where Retire Japan came from. So Retire Japan is, it started as a blog, uh, a couple of years later we added the forum which is probably one of the best parts of the site now. Um, it's got articles, we've written a couple of ebooks. Uh, this year I started running a course, so an online live cohort that, that explores personal finance. That's called Your First 10 Million Yen. Uh, and the reason it's called that is because I think pretty much everyone who isn't, you know, on the poverty line should be able to eventually save up and invest their way to 10 million yen in savings and investments. And that is significant enough that it would, you know, change your life, basically. It would make your life much more comfortable, much more secure. Uh, and of course, once you have 10 million yen, it's, it's much easier to get to 20 or 30 and so on. So that's what that course uh, is doing. And I also do coaching. So for individuals, if people want to talk about their options or, or have me look at what they're doing and maybe give suggestions, um, that's what the coaching is for there. Okay, so I think I've covered my, me, uh, and retired Japan. <laughs> and then well, let's talk about the basics of investing in Japan. So I think the first thing we need to consider here is whether someone is a US citizen or not. Because unfortunately, US citizens are in a much more difficult situation than anyone else when they're trying to invest in Japan. And the reason for that is because the U.S. taxes citizens on nationality, whereas pretty much every other country taxes people on residence. <clears throat> so for U.S. citizens, we've got a situation where they're in Japan and they're still under U.S. tax law. So they have to do a, a, a tax return to the IRS. They have to follow the U.S. tax rules. But they also live in Japan, where they have Japanese tax rules uh, and Japanese financial institutions. Uh, and these two systems just do not mesh very well. So in practice, what this means is that for most U.S. citizens, um, they shouldn't even bother to try investing in Japan. And instead, they should use a U.S. broker account uh, and invest in the U.S. Um, and then you know, bring money over to Japan when they need it uh, and so on. 
for everyone else, investing in Japan is great. <laughs> so um, it's fairly open. There's no real restrictions on, you know, based on nationality, at least. Um, pretty much everything in Japan is based on residence. So as long as you live in Japan, um, you'll be able to open investment accounts and use the tax advantaged accounts that Japan has been creating. So the NISA account and the Ideco account. And those are the main things that most people should think about doing. Um, because if you're going to invest, you might as well not pay taxes on it legally. <laughs> so, and that's what NISA and IDECO allow you to do. <clears throat> so NISA is an investment account. You can put in a certain amount of money every year, and it's tax-free for a certain amount of time. Um, however, um, the government seems to be thinking about uh, upgrading the NISA accounts, so improving them. Um, and that's going to be announced next year. So I don't really want to go into too many details about NISA because it's quite likely that that will change in the next couple of months. Um, but NISA is basically you can you can put put money in each year. You have an annual allowance. You put money in, and then it's tax free for a certain amount of time. And uh, when you sell, you don't pay any tax on capital gains uh, or dividends that you receive while the the investments are in the account. Ideco is a pension, so it's a self managed pension kind of account. Uh, and <clears throat> what Ideco does is it gives you a break on your, it gives you a kind of tax reduction on your income tax. And in return, the money's locked until you're 60 and it can grow mostly tax free uh, until you cash out between the age of 60 and 75. So that's aimed at retirement and NISA is aimed at kind of general investing. With the NISA, your money's not locked away, so you can sell at any time. And that's the main thing most people should think about doing. So, I mean, um, get NISA and Ideco, uh, probably use mutual funds. Mutual funds in Japan are a very good option because they have pretty low fees uh, and they're allowed to reinvest dividends. So you're not paying tax on the dividends before you put the dividends back in. They can do that internally. And yeah, for most people, that's it. <laughs> it's so easy to get started investing in Japan and to do something fairly sensible that is very hands-off, doesn't take a lot of time, uh, and can be automated. Because, of course, if you automate things, they happen in the background. You don't have to think about them or remember them. Uh, and eventually, uh, you know, if you get used to investing regularly every month, eventually you don't even notice that that money's not there because it's, it's never there, right? It's always... It's the concept of paying yourself first. So... What I find really helpful is, is on payday, <laughs> I take the money that I'm planning to invest and I just invest it. And then whatever's left over is mine to you know, spend on rent and food and books and things and pens. I'm, into, I'm quite into pens and notebooks. So. <laughs> okay, I think that's probably it um, in terms of me talking away into the void. Um, I'm hoping we'll have some questions now um, so we can have more of a conversation, I think. How's that? What do you think, Maya? Yes, thank you so very much. Uh, yes, we welcome questions. Uh, I hope that we will get some of them uh, on Clubhouse or on LinkedIn. Um, I have a few questions uh, for you first, because and they're very basic questions anyway, because the first thing is that uh, how do you actually, um, you know, start your, or how do you open your IDECO? Uh, is it an account or how do you register with the system? So do you go to the bank or do you go to, uh, how do you do that? Because it's a very basic question, but for many foreigners here, you know, it's a big barrier, especially if you don't speak the language that well. Yes. Okay. That's a, that's an, that's a great question. Um, so Ideco is a little bit complicated because it's run by the government through a bank or a broker. So there's quite a bit of paperwork. <clears throat> and it can take quite a long time to get the account up and running. But in terms of how you apply for it, the first thing you do is you'd open an investment account. Uh, and I normally recommend using an online broker like Rakuten or SBI or Monex. Those are the kind of big three. And the application is very simple. So it's only a couple of pages, um, you know, name, address, personal information. But one of the sections will be, I want to open an Ideco account. And you just check that box. They'll send you the, the paperwork. The paperwork's pretty easy. 
Um, but it depends on your employment situation. Uh, and specifically, it depends on what kind of nanking you're paying into, what pension system you're paying into in Japan. Because there's two main types. There's the Kosei nanking, which is for employees. And then there's the Kokumin nanking, which is kind of for freelance or self-employed people. Uh, and if you're paying into Kosei nanking, um, you have a short form to fill in for yourself and you, you also have a form that you would give to your employer and they need to fill in. Uh, and it, they have a legal obligation to, to fill that in. It's not optional for the employer. Um, and then, you know, there's basically two ways you can pay for either go. One is from your bank account and the other is deducted directly from your salary. Uh, and that one's a bit easier because then all the tax calculations are done by the employer. Uh, and then every month you pay a fixed amount every month. So you decide how much. The minimum is 5,000 yen a month. Uh, and for a Kosei Nenkin payer, so a, a company employee, their maximum is 23,000 yen a month. So it's not a huge amount. Uh, but everything helps, I think. Uh, and then the if you're self-employed, if you're on Kokumin Nenkin, the maximum is 68,000 yen a month. And that's quite a bit more significant. And this is pre-tax income. So by paying into Ideko, you lower your taxable income and you lower your, for example, income taxes, local inhabitant taxes, um, your health payments, because that's based on income as well, uh, and so on. It's very, very um, valuable. That's quite a valuable tax um, write-off there. Uh, it takes about three months to open an Ideko account. Uh, and it's good to get started as soon as possible because every month you have your Ideco allowance that it basically disappears because you can't back pay into Ideco. So the sooner you get started, the sooner it helps. Um, I think you have to be under 64 or 65 in order. I mean, 65 is the limit to pay in currently. They just raised it from 60. Um, so you have to be under that age in order to pay into Ideco. Um, Nisa doesn't have an age limit though, so anyone can pay into that. Does that answer the question? I hope. <laughs> is that is that clear enough? Maya, are we still here? Oh, Can there we go. There yes, you. yes, hi, Tim. <laughs> yeah, okay. as the American here, I'm, uh, you know, none of this really applies to me. However, I'm always looking for legal loopholes. And uh, my loophole would be, I guess, my wife claiming the income because my wife's Japanese. Although it doesn't apply either because I'm I'm almost 65 and my wife is over 65. So maybe it's too late, but. Uh... You could use NISA. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I, I believe, yeah, if, if you were <clears throat> young, if you're a bit younger, um, there is a Nenkin component. So if you're paying into Kokumin Nenkin at the moment, so it's, it's a very low payment. It's about 16,000 yen a month. And yeah. the pension's not very generous. Right. But there is a supplementary system called uh, Kokumin Nenkin Kikin um, that Americans can use. So this is not kind of something that the IRS would object to. Uh, and you can put in the same amount of money that you could put into Ideko into this Kokumin Nenkin Kikin. Uh, and it's not quite as good as a system because it basically just boosts your Japanese pension, but it is tax deductible. So if you're paying a lot of income tax and you're on Kokumin Nenkin and you want to boost your, your pension uh, in a way that's not going to mess up your IRS paperwork, then please have a look at Kokumin Nenkin Kikin because that's, that's a reasonable system. Okay. That is open to Americans because not many things are. Yeah, that, and and that's and then there's another issue that has been near and dear to my heart because um, aging here, right? There are actually some benefits to to growing old in Japan. There's some great systems in place. So I'm taking care of my elderly mother. She paid into insurance, and now her day service that she goes every day a large amount of that is covered by the in, 
you know, the payments now she's collecting uh, on this insurance that she paid. Um, so those are also available as well in terms of planning for, you know. Yeah, you get- I mean, not not even available. They're compulsory. So anyone who is 40 or over has to pay into Kaigo Hoken, which is that yeah, nursing yes, insurance. Yeah. So that was a bit of a shock for me a few years ago when, when yeah. I got my first bill. I was like, what? What's this? <laughs> But I, yeah, I think it's a good system. I think any system that is a safety net so that people aren't, you know, destitute or or on the streets is is really good for society. So yeah. I'm happy to pay my Kaigo Hoken premiums. Yeah, and if we, you know, if at some point we have to put mom into a facility, it'll probably cover maybe Goman a month. So that's substantial. Um, you know, uh so again, you know, something to think about that. Is off your radar until it, it until you need it, yeah. Until you absolutely. need it, or until you're caring for somebody who's using it, right? So, very good, Maya. There you go. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I will go with one of the questions uh, in uh, the room chat on Clubhouse, and then I will continue with others as well. First of all, so the question is about Nisa. It comes from Ferran. Thank you, Ferran, for the, for the question. And the question is, what happens to the money invested through NISA once the NISA period, currently five years, is over? Ah, okay. So if you don't do anything, um, then the investments that are in the NISA account will be transferred to your taxable account, so to your normal broker account. And the way NISA makes sure that it's tax-free is the purchase price is reset. So for example, say you bought at 100 yen, uh, and then five years later, the investment is worth 120 yen. When it's moved to the taxable account, uh, the purchase price is reset to be 120 yen. So you'll pay capital gains on anything that any growth beyond that, but you won't pay for that 20 yen profit so far. Uh, so it's it's a fairly smooth system. There is a slight danger with NISA. It's pretty insignificant, but it does exist. And that is if you if your investments go down and the price is reset, then you locked in your capital loss there. So even if say you bought at 100 and it goes down to 80, when it comes out of NISA, uh, if it then goes back to 100. Uh, you would owe capital gains on that 20 there. So that is a small risk of of the, especially the ordinary NISA account because it's such a short duration. However, um, the rumor is that the the government is considering abolishing time limits for NISA. So this this issue won't be an issue in the future. So we're all holding, you know, crossing our fingers for that one. So everyone's everyone's waiting for the the permanent NISA because that's what um, NISA is based on the UK ISA, and that's how ISA mm-hmm. works. So you have an annual contribution limit, but there's no um, period to the thing. So you, you as long as the the investments remain in the account, they're tax free. So I'm hoping that's what Japan's going to go with next year. Yes, the, let's hope that uh, that is the case. We have uh, Frank now on stage uh, in Clubhouse. So uh, I believe that Frank has comments or questions. So uh, please listen to him at the moment. Okay, Frank. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Hi, good morning. Hi, Hi Ben. Nice, nice to, to virtually meet you. Um, <laughs> very interesting topic. The question is more uh, for, uh, for me as a father. Uh, Sure. Uh, I think we're having connectivity problems. So <laughs> hopefully uh, Maya will be back in a second uh, and can fill us in uh, for the question. <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to take a guess here, though. I will predict that Frank's question is about how to save for. Uh, education costs for his children uh, and we'll see if I'm right when Maya comes back <laughs> oh no uh so okay, it it sounds like okay it looks like you cannot hear Frank right I uh, yeah you cut out just as the question started so uh um, oh sorry okay quickly Frank, summarize could it? Hmm. yes could Frank could you please once again go with the question 
Uh, can you hear me now okay? I can, yep. All right, okay. No, it's not about education at all. Uh, we finished oh. that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm wrong. Go on. It, no, she's finished university. She's graduated from university. She started work with a great Japanese company um, in, in April. And so my advice to her is, look, start saving early. Um, yes. And as you were saying there, you know, just set it up so that money is going away and um, and, and you don't even, you know, it's not your money anymore. It's just going straight into a Nisa account or an uh, Ideco account or, or whatever. Um, but just from, from your perspective, you know, the, the situation she faces is um, she is she's actually already paying into a matching um, uh, like a pension fund at the right, company. Right, yeah, Great. company DC, yeah. Um, yeah. So does, would you, you know, and then she's, you know, she's paying with, with a net of a company subsidy. She pays about 20, 25% of her of her uh, of her net salary um, in rent already and you know she's sort of she likes uh, music and everything so she goes to lots of concerts so she's you know she's uh, <laughs> she's having a great life but still you know how much how much how much would you advise as you know I should push her to take those extra steps and also open an ISA account and look at an IDECO account um, yeah. or is that a thing at that age enough do you think Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a really great question and really important. So there's a lot of issues here. So I think the first one is that <clears throat> getting started is by far the most difficult thing. So even if she just opens the accounts and pays in the minimum, which is currently 5,000 yen a month for Iveco, and I think you can start Nisa with 100 yen a month. So, you know, maybe something a bit more significant, like a few thousand yen into Nisa. And if she just starts doing that, setting up the account is is maybe 90% of the hassle. And then by doing that, she's going to learn about how it works and how the investments are likely to perform and how she feels about, you know, stock market movements. And um, but just by doing that, it'll be much easier to then increase the amounts later um, when she's got a bit more money or when she's more into the idea of investing. So just getting started to, to, to begin with it is useful. Just generally, um, my, my rule of thumb for how much you should save and invest is um, as much as you can without making your life worse. Right. So the more you invest, the more secure and the more options you're going to have. But you don't want to make yourself miserable by sitting at home and eating rice and you know natto every day. So it's a balance, right? You want to balance it out. And for young people, actually, um, having experiences when you're young so is incredibly valuable. <clears throat> um, it can even compared to to investing and having money. So again, it's getting that balance right. And generally, the way to do this well, in my experience, is to make sure that you're spending money on experiences so you're spending money on relationships uh, and you're spending money on your health and and well-being right instead of spending money on you know things or kind of you know kind of luxury items or prestige items or that kind of thing yeah i think that's a, a great point because just yesterday tim and i were talking about uh, how important it is to actually invest in uh, experiences because that's also a kind of investment uh, because through doing that you invest in yourself your future self as well so yeah absolutely so i mean just just as an example i, I took a trip to thailand when i was in university with two friends and we went we spent six weeks traveling around Thailand and I still think about that trip regularly. It's a source of great pleasure to me. And that was 25 years ago, you know, and the money was significant at the time, but insignificant now. So I think definitely, you know, investing some of your money into creating those kinds of experiences that will give you dividends in terms of, you know, memories and pleasure and, and things that you learned and it's, it's invaluable. So it's, 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 definitely worth not losing sight of the purpose of life in order to make sure that you're financially secure you, you want to get that balance right you know not thinking too much about money and and not having so much fun that you forget about money entirely so right so frank i <laughs> hope that this uh, answered your question can you hear me 
Yeah, uh, excellent, Ed. Thanks very much. That's uh, thanks. Another thing you might do, Frank, is um, if if you're able to, you know, um, is kind of bribe your daughter um, by matching her nisa contributions for example or matching her either contributions in japan you're allowed each person is allowed to receive up to 1.1 million yen a year uh, before paying gift tax so if you wanted to mm -hmm. encourage your daughter to invest in nisa or Ideko, you could say okay you, whatever you put in i'll match or, or whatever and that would be a very easy way to start building that habit mm -hmm. this is what i'm planning to do with my grandkids once they get a bit older so Thanks, Tim. I'm just glad my daughter isn't listening today. <laughs> ben, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, well, Frank, this uh, recording will be available uh, after it's over, you know, so you can always uh, let it, uh, your daughter sorry, listen Sorry, Maya, to I, lost, I lost Maya again. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> no, it's a joke, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hope I didn't yes. get you into too much trouble there, Frank. <laughs> okay. I wish you could have seen my face, you know, like, oh. You lost me again like okay anyway so because we always try you know to deal with technology and sometimes there are some uh, difficulties but however so uh thank you frank if you have other questions or comments just uh, let us know and anybody uh, in clubhouse please feel free to do so um you can come up on stage and talk with ben okay we have uh, another okay so there is just a text uh, question from janos uh ben can you hear me now? I can, yep. Yes, great. So I'm going to read it out uh, for you. Okay, for the US citizens living in Japan, living. Hmm. Okay, okay, I'll read the question as it is. Uh, Janusz, I'm not sure that I understand it, but okay. So first, um, for you, uh, for the US citizens living uh, living in Japan and the income is only in the US US base is there a Japanese tax liability on the American income okay so I need to start off by saying that I I'm not a tax advisor and I'm not allowed to give tax advice but my understanding of this issue is that um, it depends on how long you've been here so people who arrive in Japan um, have a status where they're not permanently resident for tax purposes. And this has nothing to do with permanent residence uh, as a visa status. This is your tax kind of thing. So for the first five years, you don't have to declare overseas income uh, unless you bring it to Japan. Um, but once you've been here for five years, then you become permanently resident for tax purposes and you have to declare all income regardless. Um, However, um, when you are working in Japan um, and you're paid in a different country, you, you're, that income is deemed to be Japanese income because you're physically present here when you're working. Um, so the only reason it wouldn't be taxable in Japan would be if you, know, you have real estate investments in the US, for example, uh, and you're generating income and you don't bring any income you don't bring any money to japan uh, because once you transfer any money it's deemed to have been that income and therefore you need to report it to the tax office but i would consult uh, an accountant or, or the tax office directly to make sure that you're actually have a good understanding and, and following the rules Not, not a fantastic answer, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's quite tricky. Yes, yes. So thank you very much for it. Um, also, you know, you touched upon NISA and IDECO, uh, so the two ways of saving for retirement here in Japan. So both ways are provided by the Japanese government. But also we know that there are different ways uh, when you can invest in uh, private funds, so as you mentioned, mutual funds in the beginning as well. And just like uh, with IDECO and uh, NISA, I believe that for many foreigners uh, who live here but uh, are not really proficient in Japanese, um, the barrier, the initial barrier is actually fi fi finding a broker or an agency to do that on their behalf. So what would you recommend to do uh, in that case so do you uh, recommend to uh, start you know looking for on options online 
or going, you know, finding a, a let's say, um, a legacy broker, because we know that there are quite a few like Daiwa House and uh, what's that, Okasan Securities and so on and so on. But what are the options, you know, and which ones uh, would you recommend? So I don't have much experience with legacy brokers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for most people, the best option is going to be one of the online brokers uh, because they have very low fees and a really huge wide range of products. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, they don't call you up and try and sell you things because that's not their business model. Their mm -hmm. business model is to make you know a tiny spread on a huge amount of products. Whereas if you if you invest with a bank, especially, or, or perhaps with a traditional broker, I'm not, I don't have experience with those, but a bank certainly will call you up and try and you know unload <laughs> whatever investment they're trying to get rid of at the moment, you know. Mm -hmm. Even even recently myself, so I got my retirement bonus when I finished working in March and put it in the bank temporarily. Uh, and for the first time ever, they called me up and they said, oh, we noticed that you have lots of money. Would you like to buy some Turkish bonds or some ridiculous thing, right? Uh, and yeah, this is not ideal. So for me, the, the online brokers are, are the best option. Now, there is a language barrier. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know of any broker in Japan that works in English, unfortunately. Um, any well, Japanese-based broker or bank. Um, so occasionally I do meet people who were not allowed to open accounts because their Japanese you know, was deemed not to be good enough. Um, basically, you have to be able to read the terms and conditions mm -hmm. in order to legally agree to open the account. Now, of course, <clears throat> Japanese people don't read the terms and conditions either, right? Because it's 50 pages of, of legal stuff. But um, with, the, with the online brokers, you can normally apply online and get through the entire process without actually talking to anyone. So as long as you have someone to help you, um, you know, with the understanding the, the, the application form, and then once the account is open, understanding the, how the website works, and you can use Google Translate and, and so on to help you. Um, and it's pretty simple. Once you know which two or three buttons that you, you need to use, that's it. Right. Yes. And actually, I've been making um, videos on YouTube, um, just going through the menus and explaining what various things are. So that might be a, a good place to go if you're confused about one of the major online mm -hmm. broker sites. Yes, you mentioned your videos uh, to everybody who is in Clubhouse. Uh, please, please uh, be aware that I shared all the links uh, to uh, the resources that uh, Ben creates in the room chat. So you can go there, click on the links so uh, you can find uh, the Retire Japan website, also the forum, the link to the forum, okay, uh, as well. Uh, the link to his Twitter account and the YouTube channel. Uh, so those are resources, invaluable resources that you can use. They are open to everybody. And of course, always you can connect with Ben on LinkedIn or on any, any of these platforms and, uh, you know, join one of his uh, training, uh, coaching sessions and uh, maybe the course he's currently um, running. Also, yes. Uh, okay, yes. Ben, a big thank you for Janusz for your... Uh, for you. Oh, <laughs> my pleasure. Even though it wasn't a great answer, but yeah, I would <laughs> I would talk to the tax office. Um, the tax office in Japan generally is is pretty professional and helpful, uh, mm -hmm. and it's not a kind of punitive system. Mm -hmm. they, they they really do seem to just want to make sure that you get your tax return filed correctly. You know, they're not trying to get more tax than you might owe. And so on. So every every time I've talked to the tax office, they've been incredibly helpful and polite. And uh, yeah, in my experience, one of the best branches of the bureaucracy here. So yes. don't hesitate to go and ask them directly if you have questions about tax. Yeah, I, I, have, an accountant I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you, Ben. I go to them every year, <clears throat> and not only do they are they very professional, they actually advise us how to report to minimize our tax burden. So. I, I completely agree. The tax, the, the, those guys are great.
Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. Um, a few years back, I forgot to file my local inhabitant kind of extra income tax, and I got a letter saying, "Hey, we noticed that you haven't filed your tax. Please come and talk to us." And I was like, "Oh my god!" You know, the tax office is going to punish me. Yeah, yeah. and I went in there uh, and I sat down with the guy, and he was like, "Okay, so you've got this extra income. You must have had some expenses, eh?" I was like, uh, well, not really. He's like, are you sure? You must have had right, some right, expenses. Right, right, right. That's and how I was like, well, I don't know. And he's like, maybe printer ink. You must have bought some printer ink. I'm like, okay. And he basically chopped my tax bill in half. Right. And yeah. I'd gone in there to pay the entire amount. And he was like, no, no, let's let's reduce this for you. Because then it brings it into line with what... Was, it was weird. It was a bizarre experience. But very, very positive. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I had the same experience. You know, like next year maybe you become your wife's dependent and you know i mean they're trying to find these angles to mm -hmm. help reduce your tax burden so i was i was quite pleasantly surprised so i i urge everybody to, yeah don't be shy about using those guys they're great you know i have a similar experience uh, when we were living in hokkaido and I was basically working, you know, um, part time for um, three employers. And then I overpaid taxes that year. <clears throat> and eventually when I went to the tax office and they noticed that and they said, oh, you, you know, you're going to have some tax returns. So they calculated the returns for me and eventually I got uh, my money back. So, uh, you know, that uh, the money that I overpaid, which was really great. And I was like, oh what's that <laughs> really a very positive experience even though i am aware that uh, if you don't speak the language you know doing all the forms you know and uh, going there it's really a, a kind of um hmm, mm, i think that <clears throat> there is a lot of um what's that stress before you experience it but uh, everybody there has been very helpful anyway so yes yeah if if you have trouble with Japanese um, I recommend calling the tax office before you go there and then they might be able to make sure that an English speaking employee can help you would be my advice rather than just walking in mm -hmm. and, and surprising them to give them a bit mm -hmm. of notice and say you know I'm going to come in tomorrow you know can someone help me in English uh, and you might you're probably going to have a better result doing that yeah that's a great great piece of advice and uh, Tim, I can see that uh, you have uh, a comment here. I wonder if anyone in our network knows of any English speaking brokers in Japan. So um, to everybody in uh, Clubhouse, if you know anybody you know who speaks English, a broker here who speaks English, let us know because uh, it will be we can share it and of course it will be a good piece of uh, advice maybe information uh, to other people who are uh, on it the might be a business idea it might be a business idea if nobody exists <laughs> to fill that indeed. whole market right? yes. <laughs> yes indeed so I was well, just gonna add though I was gonna add though whether you have a language problem or not at least where I live I'm out in Atami um, we ac actually have to make an appointment to go into the tax office to do our taxes. And they they slot you in on a certain day at a certain time and you show up and it, I think it minimizes the wait times. And maybe that had to do with the pandemic, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's that's a new system to reduce overcrowding. It used to be just go in and line up. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, all right, makes sense, okay. Um, but better, no, it's, it's much better rather than turning up and waiting for four hours. Yeah, you might. It's much better to have a little window yeah. that you're supposed to go in for. For sure, for sure. Right, and then my next question. Once again, I'm going, uh, you know, for the basics. Um, are there any websites uh, that you can recommend, like uh, online brokers? So their names, for example, because it could be an overwhelming task, you know, to start looking for such. Uh, brokers online brokers uh, in japan sure um so the the three big ones are rakuten securities um you can search for that in english and it'll come up mm -hmm. um monex which is m-o-n-e-x and s-b-i securities <clears throat> yes. and they're all very very similar so they compete 
a lot. So whenever one of them reduces a fee, the others reduce the fee. And mm. from from my perspective, I've got all three. Um, I've got accounts with all three, and they're very similar. Um, I wouldn't say one is better than another. So it's like <clears throat> if you get uh, accounts with the three of them, basically, if you master one of them, you will be okay with the others without any problems. <laughs> Yeah, the concepts. I mean, obviously, it's a different website, so things are in different places. <clears throat> and there's not a real huge reason to have accounts with different brokers, unless you're particularly paranoid. Um, the only reason I do is because I want to have access to them so I can help people if they run into problems with the websites. Right. But otherwise, I'd be perfectly happy just with one. Um, mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. That's that's good information. And we have a comment in uh, yes in Clubhouse. So tax office people at front at the front desk are quite helpful. But once they it comes to audits, they <laughs> yes. <do> that kind. <laughs> so. Yeah, my wife has been audited twice um apparently mainly because we moved tax offices uh, and that was a very unpleasant experience so but i think mm -hmm. an audit is an unpleasant experience in any country you know <laughs> right so basically if you run a company or if, if you if you run your own business uh, yeah you should be prepared for that experience okay that's good to know and uh, well tim any other comments from you or questions even. No, I was just going to say, I always saw using the tax office as a way of having plausible deniability in case you make a mistake. I'm like, hey, you guys told me to do this. <laughs> you know, that was my strategy, but it might not work when the audit comes. <laughs> right. Okay. So, and then Ben, I would like to ask you about the course you're currently running. So um, is it is it possible for people who would, who would like to learn more about investing here? Is it possible for them to join the course even midterm? Ah, okay. Well, <clears throat> it's a it's a cohort based course, <clears throat> so it, we just finished actually. The first okay. one finished um, in November, and then we're going to be starting up again probably in January. So right now we we have a, a a website. There's a link through the the Retired Japan site, and you can sign up to the waiting list for the course. And then once the course is announced, that's when you could join the the next cohort. Um, well, is there a limit to the people who can join the course? <clears throat> yes. So the, I think we'll have a limit of fifty for the next one. Okay. Well, that's a good number of people, basically. So um, yeah. So I mean, the <laughs> idea of having a, a a live component to the course is so that you've got you know peers, people that are doing it at the same time that you can talk to and maybe meet, uh, and it just makes it a bit more focused than just having, say, a <laughs> video based course where you're just watching videos by yourself. So mm -hmm. is that an in person? Uh, on campus, let's say, course, or is it an online course? It's online at the moment, <laughs> definitely. Um, I, I yeah, Possibly we could do one, but I mean, I'm not in Tokyo, uh, and mm. I think any course like that would have to, and, and basically based on people's schedules and lives, I think it's quite difficult to do it in person. We will be having a, well, we're planning to have a conference in Tokyo next year, a live conference, you know, after the pandemic. We had a virtual conference last year, but um, we'll have a live conference to celebrate our 10 year anniversary. So, Retire Japan started in 2013. Yes. So, in 2023, at some point, we're going to have a, a physical meetup in Tokyo. Um, oh, that's a wonderful, helpful. yeah, a wonderful thing to, to think about and plan, I believe. Oh, it's so fun. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Definitely. Wonderful. <clears throat> yes, because, uh, well, um, in-person meetings are basically much, much uh, better than uh, the online ones, even though, yeah, as you said, the online meetings uh, uh, allow for more flexibility and uh, probably, a, let's say, um, bigger engagement. Like Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, for, for me, Zoom's been a life changer in terms of coaching um, because it's very easy to do a one-on-one -on -one coaching call over zoom 
Right. That's great. Okay. So uh, then I think that we have uh, exhausted the questions in Clubhouse at the moment. And uh, we have a couple of uh, thank you comments uh, for the useful information. So thank you very much, Ben, for that. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. And uh, I definitely hope that we can continue uh, the conversation uh, on a, well, let's say, periodic basis. Uh, and so that we can actually bring more people, you know, uh, or help more people start thinking about investing and also start thinking about, uh, you know, uh, re retirement or how to make their retirement more comfortable. So uh, with that, it's 8.50. So we usually finish either at 8.50 or 9 o'clock. And today we're going to finish a little bit earlier. It's Wednesday morning. So everybody's getting ready for work, probably commuting at the moment. Uh, with this, thank you very much to everybody who was here. Uh, on Clubhouse or watched us on LinkedIn or, or YouTube. So it was great having you. And uh, Ben, just a couple of words uh, from you be before. Yeah, we... so I mean, absolutely. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is to help people kind of get their financial life in order because I think everyone really should have the option of having a kind of financially secure and safe life kind of financially rich life uh, and everyone can do it's just a matter of understanding your options and and making a few little choices to to make things better so completely transformed my life you know i mean if it basically if you <clears throat> if you take a little bit of time to understand basic financial concepts and how to invest and and just set up your system so it's happening automatically then you can basically eliminate money worries. And for most people, money worries are, you know, 40% of their worries, right? So if you can get rid of that, life is really good. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, definitely. Yes. So we are going to continue the, the conversation then. And, uh, well, thank you very much indeed. Have a great day. And, uh, well... A great reminder of the week. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much, Maya. Great, great information. Re very practical. <clears throat> I really appreciate it. Right. Very Thanks much. Him. Thank you.